Is that a woman, Shutter? I'm the executive director of Hope Brooks Incorporated, and this is our very first episode of Crying Out Loud here in Augusta, Maine. And um, we're actually here to introduce you to a friend of mine that I've actually met, an uh, unhoused friend of mine, and um, he has a wonderful story. And I'm going to let him introduce himself, matter of fact. He's going to be coming right on right now. I have to see my brother. So, yeah, my name is Kalen. Um, I'm currently, right now, I reside over at the Sober House right down the street from your office here, um, which I've been blessed to be able to have that opportunity. I, I was holding out a job at Damon's for a while, working in the recycling redemption area and doing also cash register. And I did that for, for a few years anyway. I had a good positive routine going every way. And then um, if, now thinking about it, I think it was something in the relationship where it just, you know, it got, it, something bothered me and I couldn't let it go. You know what I mean? And it just ate at me, ate at me, and I wouldn't let it go. And so I um, started using again to cover that up, to numb it out. Um, and then, you know, it just it's that bad, that bad mentality, that lifestyle. And it's just, you know, it's using the drugs every day. It numbs you, so it throws you off where you should be, and I think that's what was going on. As I was living in that drug stupor, you know, just trying to fool myself into thinking you're okay, just block it out and just, you know, keep on trucking. So um, just, isolation? You stay isolate yourself when you get in those areas? Um, I can. I've noticed I can isolate myself. Um, I think there's a good isolation and there can be a bad isolation, but um, yes, there, I do have a tendency. Um, like I said, it just when you have those bad traumas or memories, that can be a barrier in itself sometimes to take that next step because you're fearful. Well, I put all this effort, all this time, and then I get burned again. You know, I, I can't deal with that. I'm not. I can't go through that again. And that can be a big barrier. And I think sometimes that was some of the barriers that would stop me from trying to progress with my life because you're already seeing yourself as a failure when you haven't even tried. You know, so. I see you come alive when you're with people and connected. That's why I was asking the opposite of um, addiction is connection. Yes, I am. So agree. it's like every time we were at the center, I see you cooking for everybody, smiling your face. Right. So when I see you um, communicating with somebody, smiling your face. So um, when I see you helping, healing people, smiling your face, you seem like a healer. That's why I was asking. Yes, them. I remember you saying that. Because like with me, even though I'm an introvert, I'm a wicked bad introvert. I, I'd rather be by myself. I don't yep. like being around people. And I was like that. Well. But I glow when I'm on the right yes. people. When I'm doing the right things. When I'm not doing negative stuff, or I'm not out there trying to hustle or, or beat up somebody or rob somebody. I, I'm, I, but when I'm doing positive stuff and I see smiles on faces and I, I see um, peace getting brought over somewhere, I see that mm. light spark yes, in the eye and someone's eye and yes, come alive, sir. that brings this peace over me. You know? Right. So, and that's what makes me happy, and I'm glad you brought that up, because, like, if I can, where I'm at right now is, is I feel like is if I can 
you just make the tiniest little bit difference of, of positivity in someone's life. Whether it's, if I think it's the small, stupidest little thing, that might be the biggest thing in the world to that person. You know, we all have things that we perceive in different ways, but that's what makes me feel good because that's what I wanted when I was out here struggling, hurting, and I had nowhere to turn, nowhere to look, no, no smiling faces, no, you know, no love being, you know, sent my way. It's, it's hard, and the littlest act of love can, you don't know, could, could spark something and turn someone's day around. You know, it's, it's that little. Everything we do, I honestly feel, has a, has a, uh, for every action there is a reaction. You know. Absolutely. Um, okay, hold on. Um, start with this. Um, when did you first meet me? Oh boy, when did I first meet you? Um, I would say uh, that's probably when I was uh, staying at the Warman Center. I would say. Warman Center. Right around that time. So, um, the Warman Center. How, how did you come to find yourself at the Warman Center? Um, well, that that instance was I was living out with a friend of mine. Um, out in Whitefield, uh, which is pretty close to here, in the outskirts of Augusta. And uh, I was staying in a camper with him. It was me and him, and he had that little camper on his parents' property. Anyway, it came to the point where the camper wasn't going to be any longer livable. It was falling apart, and I was supposed to stay in him for so long. But um, I found um, myself not really having a place or a place that I knew that I needed to be able to, to live. Um, to go, so I uh, I found the warming center. Um, prior to the warming center, um, you want to tell us a little bit about who Kay was then? What got you to um, a warming center? Oh boy, that's a lot of a lot of things are incorporated in that. I, think. Um, I I would say I have a beautiful daughter. She's eight years old. Her What's name it? her name is Chloe. Oh, that's Chloe. Name. Yeah, she's beautiful. Um, and, uh, her mother, Ashley, we had a five-year relationship where she was born, of course. And um, there was a lot of drugs and a lot of, um, let, let, let me back that up a little bit. Um, she's always struggled with that aspect in her life. Um, I don't know exactly what the reasons are for her, but I kind of was like sucked into it just because it's around my environment or whatnot. And I've always kind of had a little she was struggling with drugs throughout my whole life as well. You know, it was kind of like surges. I'd, you know, I'd go into it and then I'd snap out of it and I'd go back into it and snap out of it. But um, because of the, the trauma from that relationship and just um, a lot of fears, uh, it just, it went bad. We split our ways and I realize now that it, it was the best thing for all of us. I couldn't see that at the time, you know, because we always want to hold on to things that we that we feel like that we are owed or, you know, some things that are important to us. And we all do that. We want to grab onto something and not let go. Um, but that's basically what happened that led me to going to the center there because I had put my whole life into that relationship. Um, so I never didn't have many other outlets outside of that, you know. So I, you know, it was pretty much that was it. And I focused on just that one thing. So when it was gone, I had nothing, nothing. So that's pretty much how I ended up with the Mormons. Were you from around this area? Um, I've, I've traveled a little bit. Um, I haven't been to the West Coast yet, but um, I was born in Korea, in South Korea. I didn't know that. Yes, so I was adopted um, when I was three years old. So at a very young age, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of trauma going on there. I didn't even know who my real birth parents were. So I was adopted at three. My, uh, my adoptive parents, um, Sandy and uh, Ray, God bless them. Um, I, they adopted me, um, and then at the age of 15, they ended up getting a, a divorce. So um, that split the whole family up, which was kind of even more trauma on top of the trauma that was already there from being abandoned and adopted at three years old, not even knowing my real birth parents. Uh, my adoptive father, Ray, he's a minister, or he was, I should say, so life. He was in the Navy for that as well. And so when they, jeez, I don't want to get too personal, but other people's information, but they ended up, uh, he ended up having an affair with one of the women at the church. Um, so that split the family apart, and I was at a very vulnerable age at 15. So when that happened, I really didn't know what to make of it. You know, here they adopted me, took me in, pretty much saved my life, is how yeah. I saw it. 
And then uh, that happened. So I didn't know what to think. You know, they got divorced and he cheated and he, especially being a minister, you know, it didn't look good. So I didn't really know what to think about all that. It, it wasn't good, and I'll say that. Um, at the time, I couldn't see it for what it is. But uh, so that trauma on top of that, I think was a foundation for me to struggle, you know, because I've been on the street since pretty much I was 16 years old after I went and stayed with my adopted mom, Sandy. She ended up kicking me out because I was too wild, not going to school, didn't care about school. I ended up dropping out, um, smoking pot, um, you know, staying out all night, having her worried, you know. So. What was it like living on the streets? It's rough. It's rough, man. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you uh, at that time, growing up as a teenager, you know, I, I had no role models. I had nobody to show me how to be or how to do. So you, so you get, uh, you get, you know, you get to that savage mode because you're, you, you only have you when you're out there on the street, and you don't know how to do things right or wrong. You just, you're kind of just doing what you do, and you're trying to learn from that. You fail, you learn, you know. So it can be rough. It can be rough. It's tough. So I'm coming back up here when I um when I met him, he was actually serving the community while stuck in the community and this recidivism of being on the Very streets. True. You know, I myself had just uh, recently started a company with a group of friends, and we've been out trying to help the unhoused community. And this guy was I didn't even know he was unhoused. <laughs> I had really you know I didn't even know you were unhoused, man. He was just so humble all the time and just like helping everybody. I'm like, who the hell is this guy? And I watched you, I watched you from afar because I usually recruit all my organizers. I, I watched them do the work and I sat back and then I came in and um, I asked him hey, would you like to start organizing with the mobile unit with us and I'm helping us out and he's been helping out with 7% you know so I met you at the ARC um, yes talk a little bit I mean what was your experience on um, being homeless and just like uh, having only so many um, resources yeah so like that's today. Yeah, and so like, yeah, and that's I'm glad you asked me that because that's very rough as well when you're out here on the streets by yourself. Um, you know, it's kind of a learning process, just like everything. And the art, um, the art was a great thing for me because it was an outlet where I was able to, even though I'm struggling with my own issues and traumas that I'm trying to, you know, resolve and work around, I knew that part of the part of the healing process for me was to be able to give back and help others through these yeah. times that. I wish I would have had someone to be able to talk to and help guide me. And um, so the ARC was a beautiful thing for me because it was an outlet for me to be able to kind of volunteer my time. And, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of, like, monetary, you know, money. On, but that's not, there's other things right. besides that, you know. When you can actually, um, you know, provide actual love and uh just understanding to people, you know, they just want to yeah. be felt and heard and, you know, validated, you know, and uh, we all have our different ways that, you know, we, uh, you know, accept that or, or whatnot. But um, it was a beautiful thing. The art was a beautiful thing for me because it was able to, I can humble myself to the point where, okay, it's, it's bigger than me. And, um, you know, because a lot of my life, when, especially when you're 16 on the streets, you become a selfish human being. Yeah. That's all you know. That's all you learn because you're just surviving. You're trying to flesh. survive. That's all we're doing if you're not fresh, right. and that's the number one. Right. You know, at the ARC, too, I mean, same thing with me. I mean, I, I, I found a community, a tribe at the ARC, you know. When we were um, running the ARC, um, he was amongst the community that would come in and take ownership of the ARC, um, unhoused. And um, people, once, once they started taking um, ownership of, of a space, it was like, it was beautiful to watch everybody was like making their home, cleaning up after themselves. Um, you know, by the time I, I left, everything was clean. The smell, it was like mopped and everybody was doing their jobs. No, there was no um, mis, mis vulgar use or anything, but um, I I loved that about you. That's why, that's when I caught my eye. I was like, yeah, this guy's hopping. And, and that's the same with me. I, I love to serve. For me, it was service work. Um, I didn't know what I needed. I, I always... You know, I lived a different life. It wasn't so much me being in recovery of drugs. It was crime, you know, mm. lifestyle, you know, being on the streets. I was True. homeless. My mom died on on the streets as well when I was in prison. I couldn't do nothing about it. But, um, you know, some of the people, the most humblest people I meet are the people that have nothing at all. They have nothing at all. That can be very true. And, you know, I remember when I was living on the streets. So, and when I met you guys, you guys were homeless in the... In the, in the the woman said, it, it, it was wintertime. Oh, I know. Sure. I mean, let's really? talk about that. I mean, how do you guys, how do, how do people survive in, in 20 below zero weather? 
little place to go. Yeah, it's, it can be brutal, like I said. Um, at this, uh, the warming center, they had, uh, you know, the 7 to 7, yeah. uh, 7 p.m., they'd open the doors and um, let you pretty much, you know, you spend the night there. And then 7 o'clock the next morning is when, you know, everybody gets pushed out and then they lock the door. So um, that's a challenge in itself is for, you know, people that don't have a place to call home. You know, they, you know, where are they going to go? What are they going to do? Especially if they're trying to stay sober. Especially if they're trying to do the right thing. Um, you know, because it, it's it's hard when you don't have a, an environment where you feel safe to be able to explore these new things that you're trying to incorporate in your life. You know, so it is. It's a challenge. And but that's what the arc was able to provide for me. You know, and in my perspective, it's something is what you make out of that. You know what I mean? 100%. You know, so. Um, it's funny that you mentioned how you mentioned earlier because I told someone just the other day, you know, uh, right now the, is the very least possessions, like materialistic items that I have, but I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life. Yes, yeah, and good. I don't even really know. I mean, I, I could explain it. I just don't want to go there right now because there's a lot. Of, there's a it's lot okay. to that. But it's, um, okay. it's very true. You know, when I had money, I had vehicles. You know, I had people trying to. You know be my friend because of the things I had and you know maybe I knew it at the time and I and I probably did but I didn't care you know but yeah. now now that uh, my pro my priorities are different it's it's a whole new world it's just a whole new world like it's almost like being reborn it's like, yeah. that's how I like this but so you say I was using the warmer center and now you in um the recovery house at Fresh Start yeah fresh, fresh out fresh out as Brandon Kobe's operation on yeah um what's it like in there good guy Brandon Kobe um, it's, I think it's been a very good experience for me lately. Um, like, just like anywhere else, you're going to have obstacles, you know, you have a bunch of different people, individuals in there that are trying to stay sober and they're trying to, you know, with the healing process. So there's always, you know, things that you're going to, um, experience that maybe you didn't want to, you know, other people's issues and stuff like that. So it's, um, it's a challenge because I try to use those things to try to better myself. Anything I come across, I try to use it to better myself. Whether if I think it's bad or good or, you know, it just, it is what it is. And how, how am I going to receive that energy? So it's been a very good experience for me. Um, which is weird because there's, I know, I talk to someone else and all I've heard them do is complain and bitch and moan. I'm sorry about the language, but so. and it just—I mean, I—I I can understand that 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 aspect of it and that perspective. It's just—it's uh, funny to me though because like I'm on the whole other end of that spectrum now, but I can relate to it. Um, so, just like anything, it is what you make it, you know. But yeah. but it's it's definitely I think I'm grateful to Brandon Toby. It, it's allowing me to be able to use it to step up and try to better myself, and that's all I want right now is that opportunity. I have the other questions too. I remember um, when you was um, on the house, uh, you didn't have a social security ID. Oh, what no, was I that didn't. like? Oh boy, that was, um, you know, just like everybody else, we can uh, procrastinate on stuff. And um, like I knew I wanted to, you know, I had the plan set up, but it's just getting myself in motion, you know, like trying to take the initiative. Um, so I didn't have my social security card, I didn't have my birth certificate, or I didn't have my ID because the last place that I had moved from, I ended up losing all that. I left it there, and they locked the stuff up, and I couldn't get to it, so I lost all that. And I already knew this, but come to find out, once I got out here on the street, you need those things to be able to survive. <laughs> right, we didn't need them before. No, I didn't, <laughs> I mean, care. I didn't give I a shit about them. Yeah. Right, but now I'm out in the real world, and it's like, okay, you need these things. You need your ID, you need your birth certificate, you need your social security card. Yeah. Just the simplest things to get a job now, you know? They, right. they need to have those things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They need to have those things. So uh, it was rough. Um, I just actually completed that and it's, it might seem like a small thing to most people and it, it probably is but for me it was huge it was huge because it was just it was just another step in me validating okay you you're worth this you you got this you can keep going you know you're making taking the steps okay take the next step so it's for me it's just one foot in front of the other right now you know just taking bring it on to bring taking the day on you know so you're touching on some two barriers man let's talk about barriers of oh, talk about barriers that you have now as being on house, and how would it be? Like, what, what, how could, how could the community or the laws or how could things be different to be um, help more helpful or resourceful for um, people that are on house now? Like, how, how could things be easier? Like, what, what could we do to make things better? Yeah, um, 
Like, I mean, it'd be nice if there's more, you know, more places that people could go to. There's not, it's pretty limited around here, I've noticed. Um, I, I honestly feel, though, when you ask me that question, is, is, um, is bettering people, just us being better as human beings. Because, I mean, there's a lot of people out here in this population that know nothing about this or care to know about this stuff. It doesn't affect them, you know what I mean? So that can be a barrier right there, just not wanting to involve yourself into something uncomfortable. So, and like I know we've talked about, um, I'm at that point where something makes me uncomfortable. I try to delve into that because that's something, something inside of me maybe has a fear of somehow, and I might not even realize it, you know what I mean? But that, uh, that is pretty much like an alarm for me is, hey, you know, you need to take a look at this because you're not comfortable. So what's really going on right there? You need to study this, analyze it, and be all right with it. So, yeah, yeah, so that's how I try to look at it. I love your philosophy on things, man. Every since I, I, I've met I don't think I've ever seen you get mad yet. I've seen you get like, irritated. Oh, I like, definitely and then get walk mad. away. Not but mad, you handle mad. yourself in a very good way. I, well, thank you. I, 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 I'm still working on my anger issues. I got those. We all are. We all are. <laughs> sorry, though, but, but thank you, though. I really appreciate that because a lot of people don't notice the little things like that. I do. I see that in a lot of things because I, I, I see things I want. I want peace. I, I want to be more yeah. humble as well. Yeah. Um, what do you see yourself on in the future? What do you see future? Yeah, man. And that's what I was searching for is that peace. Um, honestly, I, right now, I don't even know right now. I just, um, I'm just focused on trying to better myself, you know, as a human being every day and every day. And I, and I give it up to my higher power that what's for me is going to, I'll be led to it or it's going to be led to me. I just need to keep on working on myself and bettering myself as a human being. And whatever is meant to be is going to, is going to be. And it's just, that's how I'm looking at it. Right? One foot in front of the other. 100%.